All right, we're going to get started here with 14.6, tangent planes and differentials. Uh, so let's take a look here. Uh, first off, we have the gradient vector, del F here, and it's orthogonal to any velocity vector of the smooth curve in the surface through P0. So we have some uh, F of X, Y, Z equals, uh, you know, some W or something, and we're setting this to a constant. So we're essentially getting a level curve or a level surface, I should say here, since we're setting it equal to a constant. And then, of course, our gradient is perpendicular to those level curves, because if you think about it, the level curves and the level surfaces are the directions in which our function is changing the least. Since it's a constant, the change in that direction is zero. And therefore, orthogonal to that is where it's going to change the most. And so you see here, you have this blue surface here, right? I'm coloring over it in red. But you have this blue surface here, this level surface uh, inside our function. We have del F right there being perpendicular to it. And then, of course, uh, any of the curves along that surface that are going to be perpendicular to that. And therefore, the velocity vectors along any of those curves on that level surface then are also going to be perpendicular to del F, and we have them through that point. Uh, so if we come over here, we can come up with a tangent plane then, since we have a normal to the plane, and we can have vectors inside that plane. And so the tangent plane at point P naught, X naught, Y naught, Z naught, on the level surface, F of X, Y, Z, equals a constant C of a differentiable function. F is the plane through P naught normal, to our gradient evaluated at P naught, all right? And so the normal line at the surface of P naught is the line through P naught and then parallel to del F. So if you wanted to come up with a tangent plane, you've got a normal vector right there you can come up with at P naught, and then you can use that uh, to and, and a point in that plane to come up with a tangent plane, so maybe like a velocity vector or something from it. And then, of course, if you want to come up with the normal line, you just take that, that gradient vector evaluated at P0 and turn that into a line, just like we did uh, a couple chapters ago. Well, I can't remember if that was one or two chapters ago, chapter 12 or 13. Uh, so here, we've got the tangent plane, and you can see that we've got that right there. We just have, uh, what is this? I thought I wrote that down. Yeah, I wrote it right here. I just wrote it on the wrong page, sorry. Uh, this is n normal dotted with p naught p, right, to get our vector. And so here, del f is our normal, and then we're going to dot it with a point uh, in that plane, and that's going to be that p naught p then here, p naught p. Uh, we're doing that there. And so that's what you see here. When we dot them, this del f, remember the components of it is going to be uh, you know, del F written as components is going to be Fx in the i direction plus Fy in the j direction plus Fz in the uh, k direction. You know, our partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y, partial derivative with respect to z, uh, based off our del operator in the Cartesian coordinates. And so you end up with that evaluated at p naught times your shift. Uh, or your, you know, your component of your p naught p vector, right? So here's our plane, here's our p naught p vector, and then we have that perpendicular uh, del f vector right there. Okay, so that's our p naught p vector, and they are perpendicular to each other, and therefore uh, we can just go ahead and do that. And that, and that's what we did to come up with planes as it was before, was that this equaled zero. And so this still equals zero. So here are all the actual components after you do the dot product, and there they are equaling zero. Now for doing a line, on the other hand, uh, remember it was uh, our line equation was r of t equals r naught plus vt, which we have there, right, where we had that. And so our vector in this case here is going to be then, here's our r of t, this is going to be, uh, what are we going to have, p naught, sorry, not r naught now, so p naught, right, as our vector here, and then plus del f for v times t, right, so, and that del f is, of course, 
a vector, and I didn't do a very good job with that del, but del f t, like that, right there. And so that's what that one becomes. And then here, this is just the x component, the y component, and the z component. So we have it all nice and linearized uh, or parameterized out right there. Okay, so that just comes from our old stuff of turning uh, vectors into planes and into the lines themselves. So here you can see an example you can try. I'm not going to go through and do this one, but you can see the result there is find the tangent plane and normal line of the surface there. So just go through, find the gradient of it, and then just find a surface based on that and find a, uh, you know, a normal line based on also that gradient vector. And it's at that point, P naught one, two, four. And this is, of course, this is X squared. Sorry, this whole function just looks, this should be F of X y z equals x squared plus y squared plus z minus 9 equals 0. So that's on our level surface. So go through, calculate del f, calculate that gradient, del f, which I guess I'll do that part for you. Uh, it's going to be uh, 2x, because x, 2x in the i direction, plus 2y in the j direction, right? Because we treat everything but y as a constant. And then in the z direction, uh, it's just one, so just k right there. And then go through, and there is your vector that's perpendicular. Use that point to find, to plug in and find a plane, and then also use that and make it a line as well. So it shouldn't be too hard for you, stuff we were doing before. There's del f with the vector sign, okay? Uh, after that, uh, here we are again. Now the plane tangent to the surface, here it is. Uh, the plane tangent to the surface, z equals f of x, now instead of f of x, y, uh, of a differentiable function at uh, at the point p naught x naught y naught z naught equals x naught y naught f of x naught y naught is this here. Uh, and so this is uh, pretty much the same thing here, except uh, we're kind of doing this, this special case where, you know, the z partial becomes uh, 1, the partial derivative of z becomes 1. So if we look at this one, this is actually z equals x cosine y minus y e to the x at 0, 0, 0. So find the plane tangent to it again. Uh, first thing you want to do is start with del f, in which case this is going to be uh, cosine of y in the i direction, right? Because that's the derivative of this, uh, minus y. Oops, I shouldn't have put the y direction yet. Cosine of y minus y e to the x in the i direction. And then uh, and then go from there. We have the plus uh, derivative of y. Derivative of cosine of y is negative sine. So uh, this will become a minus, uh, minus uh, x sine y. And then minus y e to the x just becomes... Uh, well, we have a minus, we're gonna distribute it in, so I'll make it a plus e to the x in the j direction. And then, uh, and then of course, when you do the derivative of this, remember this equals, we wanna set this up as a level, so minus z. And so then that just becomes a one on there, a minus one in the k direction like that. And that's where we get that minus from right there. Okay, so again, after that, you should be able to go finish that uh, by, uh, by plugging it in and getting this uh, tangent surface. So it's just a matter of plugging it into there, uh, in which case, what does this become here? Remember, this is fx, this is fy, and this is fz but we don't have to write the fz there because it happens to be 1 or negative 1. That's why we have the minus sign. Okay, and so then just plug in those points, 0, 0. So cosine of 0 is 1 minus 0. So uh, if we do fx at the point 0, 0, we get 1. If we do fy at the point 0, 0, uh, we will get, uh, what do we get there? Zero and then one. So this will also be a one, except minus one, because we have that minus sign right there. And then uh, 
then we don't have to worry about the FZ, that's already just negative one. And so then it's a matter of just plugging this in. This is going to be X minus X naught, which is zero. So X minus zero times one plus or minus one, because it's a minus one here. So minus uh, Y minus zero, and then minus Z minus zero as well, all your, your knots. And so this just is x minus y minus z equals zero right there, okay? And that should be it for you. All right, so moving on here, you can see uh, example three. We have a surface here for x squared plus y squared minus two equals zero. So again, these should be squared. I don't know why they're x squared plus y squared uh, minus two equals zero. That's our actual surfaces there. And z minus four equals zero and so we have um sorry we have a plane and it's interlapping overlapping with this cylinder and we can find the parametric equation for the tangent to e at that point so again del f should be tangent to it at that point and you can go through and and do del f for the cylinder and del g for that plane and then they are perpendicular to each other and so then you can do a cross product of the two of them all right, uh, here, let's do some estimating the change in F in a direction of U. So to estimate this, we're going to the change in a value of a differentiable function. Sometimes this is simpler than actually trying to calculate it out. I know this kind of stuff is used in computer science stuff and in computer simulations. Uh, so when we have a differentiable value function F, when we move a small distance DS from a point P0 in a particular direction U, we can essentially say our change there is going to be our directional derivative dotted with our little teeny tiny different uh, distance increment that we took. All right, so directional derivative, which we found before, was just taking our gradient and dotting it with the vector in the direction we were trying to look. And then, of course, um, that times our little incremental amount that we moved. If you keep these small, uh, then that ds is small, then this should be a pretty accurate um, estimate there. So let's see an example here. Estimate how much the value of f of x, y equals y times the sine of x plus 2yz will change if the point p of x, y, z moves 0.1 units from p naught 0, 1, 0 straight towards p1, 2, 2, negative 2. All right, so first... We need that directional derivative, so we got to start off uh, by figuring out the directional vector, the directional unit vector. We're going from p naught to p1, so it's the vector p naught to p1 divided by its own magnitude. Uh, go through and calculate that, and you should get that vector right there. So now we have that unit vector. Next, we need the gradient vector at that point. So you calculate the gradient, which is right here, and then you plug in that point, 0, 1, 0. And so now there is our gradient at that location. There is our unit direction that we want to go in. And if we dot those two together right here, then we have our directional derivative right there for it, negative 2 thirds. Okay. Uh, the change df in f that results from moving that ds little point 0.1 that they tell us right there, we're moving that little ds right there. Uh, one unit away from p naught in the direction of u is then simply multiplying that directional derivative times that ds, and we get about negative 0 0.067 units there. Okay? And that's about how much it'll change there with a nice little estimation. Okay? Let's take a look here. Here we can get some more uh, approximations going if we do the linearization of a function. Now, if we linearized a function of one variable, like a function of x, we ended up with a straight line. It was a tangent line there. Uh, here, when we do this linearization, what we're going to end up with is a linearization that is a plane. So if you take a look at this, uh, what actually happens is you can say f, uh, if we base this on our definition of uh, differentiability, we can have this, x naught uh, y not like this, and then we had our partial at x not, y not, 
times delta x plus our partial derivative in y times x naught y naught uh, or evaluated at x naught y naught times delta y. I think I said times x naught y naught. And then we had our epsilons plus epsilon 1 delta x plus epsilon 2 delta y. And if we take this in the limit that our epsilons go to zero and our delta x's go to being very small still, then these two numbers at the end are going to be very small and essentially disappear. And we can then approximate this by adding this over to the other side and get this version right here, where you have our linearized plane here. Okay? Uh, and so that is what we end up getting there, is that linearization into a plane right there. Okay? Uh, and so, yeah, we get this tangent plane to the surface of this function of z of x whatever it happens to be. And so this tells us that as long as we stay near that place, that if we don't move too far away, so we have some we have some surface here, right? Whatever it happens to be. And then we have some plane that's coming along, say, and is tangent to it at that point, right? We have this tangent. As long as we don't move too far away, then the value along that plane, which is a little simpler potentially than our actual function, uh, is going to be approximate that value. Kind of like if we had a parabola before, and we looked at this point, and we did an approximate linearization. Uh, you know, if we look, yeah, it's curved. Yeah, it's not a little bit off. But if we're if we're not going too far, if we're only going just a little bit away, they're still really close in value. And so this will work as a nice little approximation for that kind of a situation. All right. And so here it says find this linearization at this point. Um, I think I'm going to leave that for you to try, so you don't have to just sit here and watch me working these numbers out. Um, but you're going to plug in the point 3, 2. You're going to plug it in right there. You're going to find the partial derivative with respect to x. That's that right there. And evaluate it at that 3, 2. And then you're going to plug in that 3 right there. And then you're going to plug in the 3, 2 here in the partial derivative with respect to y. And then you're going to uh, plug in that 2 over here in that. And it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, to kind of go through, you're just taking partial derivatives and plugging in those three two points uh, based on that. So give that a try, make sure you can do it, uh, and let me know if you have any questions on it. Uh, here you can see a nice little picture showing this idea uh, that we're at this point x not y not where we want to see uh, what our approximate value is, and we're going to move a delta x delta y away, and we're going to get this approximation here that was uh, based on that uh, previous page with our approximation of f of x is approximately equal at uh, near that point x naught y naught okay the standard linear approximation and there's a little little picture of it of we're moving that amount in x and according to that slope in the x direction and then of course the amount in y based on that slope in the y direction there which we have right there the slope in the y direction essentially all right uh, here we have a rectangular region uh, if we ignore the x naught y naught we're essentially just saying uh, we have x that is less than or equal to h, so it'd be, you know, say this is positive h, we have to be less than it. This is negative h over here, so we have to be somewhere in between them. And then, of course, for k, we'd be up here, we'd have a positive k and a negative k. And so we'd have this rectangle here, and then we're simply shifting it by x naught, y naught off to the side. And then that's that rectangle we have right there when we include the x naught, y naught in this uh rectangular region in a plane. And so what we can do is come up with the error that will go along with this uh, this linearization and our standard linear approximation. And so uh, essentially if f is continuous first and second partial derivatives throughout an open set containing a rectangular r uh, at x naught y naught, and if m is any upper bound, so we're looking at the maximum second derivatives of these combinations of r, then the error e of x, y incurred in replacing f of x, y, and r by its linearization is this. And so this will tell us uh, kind of an upper bound. So this is our linearization, and then this is our boundary or our, our bound for our, uh, for our uh, linearization, for our error for it, okay? And it will satisfy this inequality. So you can kind of figure out how close and how accurate your error or your approximation is going to be here. Uh, second, uh, we have the 
uh, definition if we move from x naught to y naught to a point x naught plus dx, y naught plus dy nearby, the resulting change df where we get that change there, the partial derivative at x naught y naught times dx plus the partial derivative with respect to y, x naught evaluated x naught y naught dy in the linearization of f is called the total differential of f. All right, so let's take a look at an example here. And so let's suppose we have a cylinder can, a uh, cylinder can, cylindrical can, I'll get it out, uh, is designed to have a radius of one inch and a height of five inches but that the radius and height are off by the amounts dr for the radius plus 0 0.03 and dh by negative 0 0.01. Estimate the resulting absolute change in the volume of the can. So if we look at the volume of a can, we can say that the volume of a can is pi r squared h. Okay? And so our delta v is going to be approximately equal to our little teeny tiny dv change. And we need to know how much is the volume affected with a change in the radius at r naught, h naught, at whatever we were starting with, times our dr, plus our change in the height uh, here at r naught, h naught, uh, at dh there, times dh. So if you think about this, when we change r, all right, if we're, cha if we're leaving h constant, if we change the radius here on our cylindrical can, right, if we take a step outward in that, what do we end up with as far as our total change that's occurring there? And what's happening is we are essentially just adding on this extra little sleeve around it, this tiny little sleeve that goes all the way around this thing with that thickness there. And so we end up with a two pi r times h. It's our circumference here. It's essentially our circumference there. It's like the outer skin of our cylinder. And so this would just be two pi, uh, two pi r h, but evaluated at r naught and h naught times dr. And now if we change the height on the other hand, we're taking a little step up in height, right? We end up with a new larger cylinder, and what we get is this little extra cylinder added on to the top of it, right? When we do this, we get this cylinder added onto it, and so that change is actually going to be the, the area of that surface right there. We like bump it up like one layer of atoms or something like that, or, or molecules or whatever you think, and so it's gonna be that error that, that uh, area. So this is going to be pi r squared times dh like that. And then again, but this is evaluated at r naught. So we put that in there, r naught, h naught, but we just have r naught there. And so you can go in and plug your numbers in, right? Uh, we can plug in uh, our or original number. So this is two pi r naught is one, h naught is four, Five and dr was 0 0.03 plus pi times r naught, which again is one squared, and then times that dh, which was the negative point, not point zero one, negative, sorry, it's right there, negative point one, can't get it to undo, negative point one right there, like that. Uh, plug these all in and you know, calculate them in your calculator, and you should get about 0.63 inches cubed there for uh, how much that would mess with our volumes there. Okay? Uh, and that's it for that page. Now here, you have to pay attention here. I'm not going to work this one totally out, but essentially you have two different cylinders here, a tall skinny one and a short uh, fat one, and what happens if you work this out is you'll find that as you do the uh, the tall and uh, skinny one with a, a, a height of 25 and a radius of 5, is you'd actually find that the a change in the radius has a, uh, a big change in the volume, whereas a change in the height 
uh, will only have a small amount of change. Because if you think about this, if I change this radius, remember changing that radius gave me that whole outer sleeve. And there's a whole lot of outer sleeve here because it's so tall. But a change in the height only gave me that extra little area on the top. And there's not a lot there because the radius is small. However, if you work it out the other way, when you swap the number, so it's a short fat disc, a change in that height is going to give you this whole big area of an amount of change, whereas the radius is only giving you this little bit of amount around the edge because it's so short and thin there. So essentially, you get a general rule that functions are most sensitive to small changes in the variables that generate the largest partial derivatives. So if you take a look at those partial derivatives, the largest partial derivatives are the ones where those things are going to, uh, you know, you're going to have to be the most accurate with. If you were, if you were manufacturing these things, you know, if you're manufacturing this can, you're going to want to pay the most attention to the radius of them. If you were manufacturing cans like this, you want to pay most attention to uh, the height. Then in that case, okay, if you were some sort of engineer working on uh, the machines that made this. All right, uh, functions of more than two variables now. Uh, we can do a linearization of them at that point. Uh, it's the same linearization. We're just adding on this extra z term out here, which I think I did before. I just had this was, this was equal to one uh, before when I talked about it. But yes, you can do that. Uh, your error, again, it just extends out where we add on this extra z term there. And then the same thing for the total differential. We're just adding on this extra z term, but everything else is just more extensions out to greater than two variables, and you can just keep extending them out. All right, so here we've got find the linearization of this function. So let's actually find one here at the point x naught, y naught, z naught, which is equal to 2, 1, 0. And so we're going to find then an upper bound for the error incurred in replacing f by l. Oh, what happened? Oh no, what happened? There, are, is this where we were? Yeah, by replacing f on l on the rectangle. So uh, here, uh, what we have is essentially our x minus x naught has to be uh, basically fit inside this rectangle is what they're telling us. Our x minus our x naught, that two there, has to be less than or equal to 0 0.01. Our y minus that 1 has to be less than or equal to 0.02. And then z then minus that 0 has to be less than or equal to that. So that's the rectangle they're giving us just shifted off by x naught, y naught, and then minus 0, which is z naught right there. Okay, And so then here, uh, just doing our regular calculations, if we plug in 2, 1, 0, we get the actual value of it at that point. Okay, that's what we needed first. Okay, that's gonna give us that right there. Then we need our partial derivatives in the x direction, our partial in the y direction, and our partial derivative for z. So partial uh, derivatives of each one of those, which you can get just from uh, applying the del operator to it and then taking each the x, y, and z components, but same thing. Uh, and then we plug those in. So we have our partial derivative. That's this is going there times the x minus 2. Uh, this one's going right there. And this one's going right there. And so then that gives us that plane. Uh, that gives us this plane here that's our linearization for it. Uh, since now, we can go through and take our second derivatives of each one, all our different combinations. So here... Uh, second derivative, second partial derivative with x, second partial derivative with y, with z, and then the xy, the xz, and the yz versions. So all of our possible combinations. Oops, I just closed something. I don't know what. Um, oh, I forgot I had opened this up to show. Here's our equation for a plane, <laughs> in case you didn't remember. So I guess that was back in chapter 12. So anyway, you can go back to chapter 12. I'll show it again. That page where we did this equation in dot p naught p equals zero. So anyway, uh, sorry, I forgot to show that to you earlier. So here are all our derivatives. If you look at this, the maximum one is this one right here for, has a maximum value of three, right? The absolute value of it. And so we're gonna take m to be our maximum of that after checking all of those. And therefore we just plug this in and get our error, which is according to that equation, our error has to be less than one half. Here's our m. 
there's our amounts of our rectangles that we're off by, right? Our 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.01 right there. And that tells us then uh, our error has to be less than 0 0.0024 in this situation. So it's just a matter of remembering those equations and go through and chugging them out for something like that. Okay, and I think, yep, that was the last page for this. Uh, so that's it for this section. Uh, and we'll continue on with the next one. So thanks for listening.